Hello and welcome to a four flight presentation of how to use long range forecasts. My name is Scott Denstead. I'm a CFI and former National Weather Service research meteorologist, and I'm also Four Flights weather scientist. Now here's today's agenda. I'm going to start out with a brief overview of why it's important to leverage some of those medium to long range forecasts. Then I'm going to give you a few weather patterns that you'll want to learn to recognize. I'm going to move into some of the new four flight weather imagery that was specifically added to help with some of that medium to long range flight planning. Then I'm going to do a brief flight planning scenario to help tie a couple of these charts together. And lastly, I'll talk a little bit about model output statistics and how that can be used in your flight planning as well. Now it goes without saying that we usually don't make a go or no go decision until shortly before our flight. But is that always true? What about our return trip? That may actually influence our decision as well. You know, for example, let's say it's Tuesday, and the weather's looking pretty good for a flight today, but what about our return trip on Friday? We don't want to engender get there right. We don't want to get to our destination and can't get back home, so we need to pay attention to some of those longer range forecasts so we can make good decisions in this sense. So how do we accomplish this? Well, we need to learn to leverage some of that medium to long range forecast against our busy schedule. And I think pilots are generally pretty weak at this. Instructors spend a lot of time talking about what's going to happen on the, the next couple of hours, the next three to six hours, but not necessarily what's going to happen in the next several days. So pilots just generally don't know what to look for in these long range forecasts. We certainly like to see specifics on ceiling and visibility, icing, turbulence, thunderstorms, all those adverse weather elements. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we can extract from those long range forecasts. I'm going to start out with a few broad brush definitions. Whenever I say range, I mean referring to time and not distance. So a medium to long range forecast is a forecast that's valid more than 60 hours in the future. So whereas a short range forecast is valid somewhere between 6 to 60 hours. And what I call a nowcast is something that's valid less than 6 hours from now. And looking at the chart on the right, you can see as you get further out in time, the uncertainty increases, of course. Now probabilistic forecasts are very common for longer range forecasts. And it's all about quantifying uncertainty. Forecasters quantify their uncertainty through this kind of probabilistic approach. Now, probability forecast also depends on the size of the forecast area and the time span of the forecast. Now, I'll give you an example. If I were to say that sometime in the month of July, um, there's going to be a thunderstorm somewhere in the continental United States, there's a pretty good bet that that will happen. So the probability is very high. <clears throat> Now, if I narrow that down to, let's say, the, the state of Oklahoma in July, now it's a smaller area, but you know, what are the chances of us not going, not having a thunderstorm somewhere in the state of Oklahoma during the entire month of July? It's pretty small. So again, it's a pretty good bet that uh, that will happen. But if I narrow the time down and say, what, what about July 13th in Oklahoma, what are the chances of a thunderstorm occurring? Again, now it's a smaller time frame and smaller area. Uh, so you know, it could be that an entire day goes by without seeing any thunderstorms in the state of Oklahoma on July 13th. But if I narrow that down even further and say, what are the chances that there's going to be a thunderstorm in Oklahoma City at the airport on July 13th at 4 p.m.? <clears throat> that's such a small time and area that there's very little chance of that occurring. So that's how probabilities generally work. So I like to teach a lot of my pilots uh, some of the things that work uh, to focus on when I'm uh, acting as a CFI. I spend a lot of time focusing on precipitation areas. That's true even when we're looking at a forecast several hours from now, but especially several days from now, because they represent hot spots for concern. So we know that IFR conditions, turbulence, icing, wind, convection, all tend to occur in and around areas of precipitation. The red flags that come up along our route of flight. So we need to drill down further, make sure we understand what's going on there potentially. 
we know that precipitation can be har harmless. Even a VFR uh, pilot fl flying in precipitation areas is not always a bad thing. But most of the time, precipitation can be pretty nasty. And there also can be adverse weather in areas where there's no precipitation expected, so we can't become complacent. So here are a few different signature events to look for. Now, weather patterns, uh, if, if you ask any forecaster, they spend a lot of time looking at weather patterns and trying to understand what's happening. A lot of times that will turn them on to a specific event that's occurring uh, and, and help them understand whether they're going to be de dealing with adverse weather in a particular area. And pilots can do that as well. You can look at upper level troughs and ridges. These upper level charts, as you see the one on the top there, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time doing that um, on today's uh, presentation. Instead, I'm going to focus more on what's happening at the surface. Most pilots are very familiar with looking at a surface chart, so we're going to look at the position of surface features. <clears throat> and one of the classic events that occurs is called a cold air damming event, and it typically occurs in the late fall, winter, and early spring along the east coast of the United States. And it's the primary freezing rainmaker that occurs. And this all starts out with a surface high pressure up in New England, and that's bringing essentially clockwise air around the high near the surface. And that's bringing moist air off the Atlantic Ocean into land. And that's, that air is generally moist and, and kind of on the colder side. That cold, dense air tends to sink and get wedged up or dammed up against the mountains, the Appalachian Mountains there. Next piece to this is an area of low pressure, and generally somewhere in the deep south, it moves northeast. Sometimes it'll move move up the coast and produce a nor'easter along the uh, the New England <coughs> the New England area, as well as in the area along the uh, Mid Atlantic coast. And that essentially that air either rides up also along the spine of the Appalachian Mountains. And so what you end up getting is this warm air overruns that cold, dense air at the surface. And so what you end up having is uh, a situation where the snow from the clouds aloft fall into that warmer air and melt into rain and then fall into sub-freezing air in the wintertime that's locked in at the surface and that sub-freezing uh, temperatures produce that freezing rain event. Another kind of classic event is radiation fog. Now, it's just likely just about any time of the year, especially in the west side of a fairly large area of high pressure. Now, normally high pressure areas are fair weather um, f uh, features. However, you get high pressure, which tends to allow air to subside, which clears the air out, which is a good thing. But in the overnight eight hours, when you get air that's very clear, especially when you, the winds are somewhat on the calm side near the surface, radiational cooling takes effect and it can drop the temperature all the way down to the dew point temperature, producing a radiation fog event. And again, this occurs, uh, this is very popular, especially on the west side of an area of large, uh, high, high pressure area. And if it's rained a day or two before and the ground is wet, those areas are generally more favorable for radiation fog. Another one is called wraparound moisture. We, we, this starts out with an area of low pressure somewhere moving through uh, the Great Lakes with an associated cold front that pushes down into the deep south. <clears throat> and we get essentially a wraparound situation where moisture wraparounds the backside of the slow, counterclockwise flow, and over the lakes, producing essentially that lake effect precipitation area. And these will also lay down a pretty a nice blanket of strata cumulus clouds over a pretty large area, large region, um, including most of the su southern part of the Great Lakes, all the way down into the deep south sometimes. <clears throat> and you can also look at this from a mountain wave activity standpoint. And that is that as that area of low pressure shifts off to the east, it brings around a north or northwesterly flow, which happens to be pretty much perpendicular to the Appalachian Mountains. And that cold, dense air that's behind it from Canada tends to subside, and it heats up a little bit. When it does that, it produces a nice temperature inversion right above the ridge lines, and that temperature inversion is what enables uh, those mountain waves to occur. And so just by looking at a two- or three-day forecast, uh, even a forecast beyond that on the extended range, you can begin to sense the kind of activity that you might have in terms of mountain waves. 
Another classic event is called upslope stratus. Well, essentially what happens here is we get a high pressure that settles in uh, from the north. Uh, so we get the high pressure that moves in from the northern uh, part of the U.S. down into the Midwest and high plains. <clears throat> and this produces an easterly wind, let's say from Chicago to Denver. And we know that the ter terrain from, from, let's say, St. Louis all the way up to Denver is upslope. The terrain rises in that direction. So it's, at, it's like a very, very gentle lifting that's occurring. And so you can get this upslope uh, stratus that can produce a very widespread uh, area of uh, low stratus event as that gets, the air gets wedged up against the Rockies. You can see on the lower right, the satellite image there, <clears throat> you can almost see the, um, uh, the front range of the Rockies showing up as some of that, uh, that uh, area that's lifted and very gradually uh, from the east to the west, producing a large stratus event. Let's look at the new four-flight weather imagery. This was basically added to help with some of that medium to long-range flight planning. Includes prog charts, and we'll talk a little bit about these new NDFD progs. A six-hour quantitative precipitation forecast, or QPF, a GFS MOS ceiling and visibility forecast, and an extended convective forecast planning guidance, as well as a 12-hour prob probability of precipitation or POP forecast. Now the prog charts, we didn't necessarily change. Uh, the prog charts are still out there, and these are what we, I'm gonna call the legacy prog charts that you're used to using. We also added uh, some medium to long range progs from day three through day seven, Day one is today, day two is tomorrow, and day three is the day following. So this goes out to day seven. And there's definitely some differences, which we'll talk about in a bit. We also added what are called the NDFD progs, and we'll talk about that next. Now, NDFD stands for National Digital Forecast Database. And they're due to replace the current prog charts sometime in September of 2015. We've provided them for our four flight customers so they can become and, and basically get used to those particular forecasts. And the forecasts are available at six hour time steps out to 60 hours in the future. Now they contain a frontal forecast as well as an isobaric forecast, including areas of high and low pressure that are issued just like the other prog charts by the uh, same forecasters at the Weather Prediction Center. But now, the precipitation forecast on this chart is a little bit different. Instead of the squiggly um, green lines that you saw before, now we'll see some shaded areas. This is the instantaneous precipitation that's issued by the local weather forecast offices, not forecasters at the Weather Prediction Center like they were before with the prog charts. This is a precipitation forecast that also rep represents coverage. It's valid at the time on the chart. So this is not a forecast for precip over a, over a range of time. It actually is a forecast uh, valid at a specific time. So again, it shows you what kind of coverage will be at a specific time in the future. And the only detriment to this is the precipitation now ends at the U.S. border. It used to go into Canada and Mexico. And now because we're pulling it from the Weather uh, Service forecast offices, uh, it's only going to be the uh, basically continental United States. Now we added some extended prog charts in day three through day seven, and they're all valid at 1200 UTC every day. So day one is today, day two is tomorrow, day three is the following day, all the way through day seven. And just like the regular prog charts, it provides an overview of the major weather systems affecting the US, most of Canada and Mexico. And it provides an isobaric forecast, including high and low pressure centers, as well as frontal systems. But there's no precipitation forecast like we saw in the earlier prog charts. And the primary reason for that is instantaneous precipitation is very difficult to forecast. And so we really don't have the ability to do that at this kind of range of time. But they are also issued by forecasters at the Weather Prediction Center, just like the prog charts. The next product here is called a six hour QPF, or quantitative precipitation forecast. It's basically the amount of precipitation that's expected to reach the surface within that six hour period. 
It's also issued by forecasters at the Weather Prediction Center. And the forecasts are available at six hour time steps out to three and a half days in the future. So it helps to bridge the gap between those instantaneous precipitation forecasts that we see on the prog charts. The prog charts, as I said, are a coverage valid at a specific time. But what happens if at 13Z the forecasters expect their precipitation to start at 13Z and end at 17Z? Well, it's going to miss the 12Z and 18Z chart, whereas the, uh, the six-hour QPF will pick that particular area up. So it does help, um, all, it does help to, to bridge the gap there. But it doesn't distinguish between precipitation type, whether it's going to be snow, rain, or thunder, necessarily. And the contours here are inches of liquid precipitation or melted equivalent if it was snowfall, and it's based on the scale that you see there to the left. And you also see a little X on, on this chart as well, and that's just a local maximum of in inches of precipitation for that particular region. The next product we added was GFS MOS Forecast, and it's Global Forecast System Model Output Statistics. It's an automated categorical ceiling and visibility forecast. And the forecasts are available at three hour time steps out to three and a half days in the future. Now legend at the bottom on that particular chart shows the flight categories uh, that, that it's projecting. In this case, it's very low IFR, low IFR, IFR, marginal VFR, and VFR, and anywhere you see, see in black there, it's clear below 12,000 feet. So it represents a very good forecast, and again, it goes out to three and a half days in the future at three hour time steps for ceiling and also for visibility, and a similar categorical, categorical forecast is offered. We also added some guidance for forecasting convection called the Extended CDM Convective Forecast Planning Guidance. It's an automated forecast for deep moist convection. Not necessarily always thunderstorms, but for convective situations that represent um, uh, what we essentially what would be essentially similar to, to thunderstorms, but lightning is not necessarily uh, part of that uh, criteria. And forecasts are available at six hour time steps out to three days in the future. Now this is a forecast of convective probability over a six hour forecast period. So a six hour period is not very long at all, but when you start seeing the probabilities very high, so we end up in this particular case, there's three probabilistic levels, 80% are the filled areas, and you have a, a highly slashed area there for 60 to 79%, and 40 to 59% for the, uh, the lighter hatched areas. We also introduced the 12 hour probability of precipitation forecast or POP forecast. Now you might, if you read any of the National Weather Service forecast discussions, you'll see they reference POP forecast a lot. Now this particular forecast uh, is issued by the uh, same forecaster, same group of forecasters at the Weather Prediction Center. And it's available in 12 hour time steps to include days three through day seven. So this is a longer range forecast. And again, it shows the probability of precipitation that's uh, expected to occur in that 12-hour period. And there's a daytime issuance, and those are all essentially ending at 0Z, and a nighttime issuance ending at 12Z. So the numbers or contours on this chart represent the probability of precipitation reaching the surface in that 12-hour valid period. Larger the numbers represent a greater chance of precipitation. And the valid date time stamp is the ending time of the 12 hour period. So when you look at the valid time on the, on the lower left there, remember that it's always the ending time of that 12 hour period. Now let's take a look at a flight planning scenario and put a couple of these charts together. So this forecast is valid from 12Z Monday through 0Z Tuesday. The daytime stamp on the lower left says 0Z Tuesday, so it's the previous 12 hours. So basically, this is a forecast for the, the day on Monday. So let's say, for instance, we were, um, let's say we're, we're planning a return trip um, back to the Atlanta area. We're in Chicago, and we're going back home where we live in Atlanta. Well, in this particular situation, it's easy to see that in, in that 12-hour period, 
there's a pretty good chance, high chance of precipitation occurring in the Atlanta region. And probably maybe two thirds of our flight plan for in, in this particular trip from Chicago to Atlanta, we're going to be dealing with some kind of chance of precipitation. Again, hot spot for concern here. So I would be very concerned, especially flying VFR in this situation, or even IFR, because we may be dealing with a line of convection, for instance, in this area. This doesn't tell us what kind of precipitation will be occurring, just the fact that there is a high chance of precip in this particular region. So let's look at another trip instead. Let's say we're going back home to, to Oklahoma City from Chicago. In that particular case, the chances of precipitation are very small. Most of the entire route uh, has precipitation chances of zero. Now again, may not necessarily be completely uh, free of adverse weather, as we'll talk in a minute, um, but this certainly looks much better than our trip to Atlanta. So we notice here <clears throat> that, that precipitation, how it's oriented um, on the uh, probability chart, uh, is oriented kind of like would be on, on a frontal system, kind of linear. And so sure enough, if we look at the, the prog charts here, it's always a good idea to put these two uh, pieces together. This particular prog chart ends at 12 zeal Monday, but shows that most of that area of precipitation is essentially along a frontal system. So the fact that it's along a frontal system really gives you the idea that there's some dynamics involved here. So there's a good chance that it'll occur, probably one of the reasons why the um, percentages are so high, but also we tend to get more significant weather in areas of frontal systems. And what about our trip to Oklahoma City in this particular case? Well, we're actually going to be traveling along essentially what's called a high pressure ridge area. You can see the high pressure up in uh, Quebec and down into Ontario area, and that tends to uh, spill down, as you can see the kind of the U-shaped fashions along that ridge axis I've drawn there, uh, spill down all the way into Texas. So under a ridge, you generally protect it with areas of high pressure that generally have subsiding air. Again, it could be an early morning radiation fog event in that region, uh, but as far as ha having any significant adverse weather, very, very unlikely in this case. And of course, you can't become complacent in that re particular region. Now, there can also be adverse weather along this route, including clouds and low ceilings and visibility uh, issues, as well as turbulence, and also icing if it was cold enough. So you can't become complacent that just because there's no areas of precipitation, there could be uh, other things to worry about. But that's generally not the case in, in those situations. So when we see those low numbers there, um, we have to, to, to look at that as being uh, you know, a, a situation where um, we're favored to have a, a good weather along that particular route. But what about a strong and gusty wind? That can also happen as well. well let's go back to the prog charts. The prog charts help us there. We know that anytime you have a large pressure gradient, that means these isobars are packed closer together, um, pressure drives wind. And essentially, anytime you have a large pressure gradient, the wind speeds pick up. But you notice along our kind of route of flight there, I've highlighted uh, the separation between the isobars. They're pretty far apart, as opposed to what you might see in the northern High Plains or northern Mississippi Valley area, where those uh, isobars are packed a lot closer together. So I don't expect. Uh, landing in Oklahoma City, for instance, if that's where we're headed, uh, there would be much of a problem with any kind of strong uh, and gusty winds. And last but not least, let's talk a little bit about model output statistics, or MOS. Now, model output statistics was added uh, to ForeFlight at the end of 2014. It's a close cousin of the GFS MOS from the weather imagery we just presented. But it provides a site-specific automated forecast for an airport or reporting station. And it's broken down into groups like you might see in a TAF. So it's very useful and very familiar. And you can get to MOS by just tapping on any airport marker on the map view. So you can bring up your favorite marker. In this case, I'm showing a flight category. And then tap on that particular marker. Then you would tap on the forecast tab at the bottom of the popover that comes up. And then tap on the MOS button. You can also get to it from the airport's view by bringing up any particular airport, tap on the weather tab, and then tap on MOS. So what is MOS? Well, generically speaking, MOS combines a NOAA model forecast with geoclimatic data and removes any known model biases. Now, in English, that basically means uh, that it essentially takes a model forecast and it combines that with 
statistically based information about that airport. It knows that, for instance, it's in a, um, it's in a valley or on top of a mountain or next to a river or next to an ocean. So it knows a lot about its geography. And it also has a historical component of all the surface observations for many decades in the past. Uh, so it's got a good statistical base for it. So essentially, when the model forecasts a certain, let's say, weather pattern, a certain pressure gradient, for instance, uh, it can actually go back in its archive, so to speak, and pull out that same kind of pressure gradient and find out, oh, when this pressure gradient occurs in this kind of orientation, that the winds are usually 310 at 7 knots. So it's able to do a really good job because it's pulling from, from data, so it's really specific to that airport. Uh, forecast models generally don't produce site-specific guidance, so in this particular case, MOSS is designed to do that. But MOSS can't fix a bad model forecast. So if the forecast the, the model provides is, is bad, MOSS is going to provide a, a bad forecast as well. But it does produce what we call a half like kind of forecast out to three days in the future. And the nice thing about it is if it's, it provides a forecast for more than 2,100 stations throughout the U.S. and its territories. So it's a wide range of airports, uh, that much beyond essentially the number of forecasts, number of airports that have a, a TAF. And it also uh, shows you information for civilian and military airports as well. Now MOSS was built for aviation. It provides that aviation specific guidance for an airport or reporting station. So, so we just don't get a smiley sun or a, uh, a dark cloud showing on, on this particular longer range forecast. Instead, we get very specific information, including ceiling and sky coverage, visibility, wind speed and direction, thunderstorm uh, potential, as well as precipitation and precipitation type. And so the, the, what you see on the right is essentially the, the raw data that comes from the, the MOSS forecast, from the, from the uh, model itself. Then we have an algorithm we produced um, in ForeFlight that takes this information and improves on that so you get a TAF-like looking appearance for that particular forecast. The other nice thing about MOSS is it's refreshed hourly in ForeFlight. So every, every hour we get an update for all the stations except for 300. There's 300 stations that are only updated every six hours. All the other uh, MOSS stations are updated hourly. And just if you're wondering, uh, if you want to know when the, the fresh forecast is going to come out, new hourly forecasts are usually available about 30 minutes past each hour. Now, MOSS does have some limitations. It's not a product that can be used for legal planning purposes. It's only available in the U.S. and its territory, so it's not an international product. And it's not a zone or area forecast. It's like a terminal forecast. It's only a forecast for that particular airport. It doesn't predict temporary conditions like you might see in a TAF. And it doesn't, predict for, it doesn't forecast non-convective low-level wind shear or no significant weather. It can't predict variable speed winds or variable direction winds either. And it can't distinguish between rain and drizzle. So in ForeFlight, we just put out that it's rain. It also can't distinguish between freezing rain, freezing drizzle, or ice pellets. So we'll just say freezing precipitation in ForeFlight. And lastly, it's never amended since it's fully automated and it's updated every hour anyway. So there's no reason to worry about amend amendments to it. All right, if you want to learn more, you can always visit the ForeFlight blog at blog.foreflight.com. You can follow us on Twitter and Facebook. And if you want to learn more about aviation weather, you can visit my website at avwxworkshops.com. And you can also follow me on Twitter and visit my YouTube channel as well as shown here. Now, thanks for listening. And we'll talk to you in the next video.